Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, why do children need to feel they belong and how can adults support? And I'm in conversation with Sarah Dove. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Dove um, and I've been asked to describe myself, which is always a little bit chaotic. Um, I've worked in education, I think for 18, 19, 20 years, something like that, um, and specialised in working with children at risk of exclusion. And I use that term very broadly, so not necessarily children at risk of permanent exclusion, but children that might be isolated from the education system for a whole range of reasons, such as health reasons. Um, sometimes it might be children that can't go to school, don't want to go to school for lots of different reasons as well. Um, and I've been working in the sector for a long time. I really enjoy it. Um, and if I'm going to describe myself, I think it will be unfair to not mention that I'm a deep cat lover. Um, and I'm just really interested in human nature, what people do and why they do it. And I really enjoy working with children. Um, so, yeah, that's me. That's you in a nutshell. I love it. Um, and yeah, cat lover. We also have those who are listening. Mork is sitting on my lap, joining in with the conversation. As always, anyone who's been to like any webinar or conference I've spoken at for about 18 months has met Mork. Um, so the question for today is, um, why do children need to feel they belong and how can adults support? So that's our jumping off point. I've got a feeling we're going to go everywhere. But do you want to make a first stab at answering that massive question? Yeah, I like the fact that you chose a really easy question, Pookie. That, that's fine. <laughs> um, that's really helpful. So I think why the children need to feel like they belong, I think it is part of human nature. I think it is no different to adults wanting to feel like they belong to some type of group and being part of a community of some description or another. Um, whether or not that's their family, their friends, or people they might meet in less than salubrious situations. I think for me, belonging encapsulates ideas about freedom um, and safety to express your identity and who you are in a way that's comfortable and nurturing. And if we looked at the idea of kind of human nature in particular, obviously I have to talk about Maslow, um, not that I'm paid to, um, but as Maslow's argument around feelings of belongingness um, as being a central kind of tenet of human nature is key um, and I think predominantly it's about co being confident that you fit in um, and to be safe on who you are um, and I think children are no different from adults in that way and they might explore that concept of belongingness in different ways that adults might do um, but their feelings of belongingness still kind of exist and I think essentially we're you know, we spoke about cats, didn't we? Now, cats aren't necessarily pack animals, but I think humans are. Humans like to have that feeling of being part of something bigger. And you um, do a lot of work now, um, and, and maybe you want to talk a bit more about your role here, but in alternative provision. And I think that's why I picked up on, on this idea of belonging, really, because I love alternative provision and people referral units and all those places that children and young people go when actually it feels like maybe they're not belonging anymore somewhere else and the environment that you have to create there in order to try and help often kind of rebuild kids in quite a basic way and and make them feel wanted I don't know that's I guess that's why this was the thing I wanted to pick up with you but would you be happy to talk a little bit about that and about your yeah working in AP and yeah yeah, so predominantly because of the work is work with children at risk of exclusion, I've mainly worked in pupil referral units and alternative provisions. Um, and this idea of belongingness became really key to me um, when I was researching for my PhD. And in that PhD, I spent, I think, six months in an alternative provision in one of the home counties. And part of that was focus group meetings. It was um, in-depth interviews with children as well as participant observation. And one of the key features of that research was their, their feelings of belongingness in the alternative provision. And there was a kind of natural dichotomy with how they didn't feel like they belonged in mainstream. And we kind of explored that together about what does belongingness mean to you? And for the children, they spoke about ideas about, again, about um, some children were really strong that the AP alternative provision was like family. Um, so they described, for example, teachers, um, she's like a mum to me, was one of the things that they spoke about. It was very sweet. And they spoke about those kind of those kind of regular routines that you have where you eat a meal together at lunchtime and like part of the family. And then not all children felt as strongly 
like that in terms of alternative provision, but they all named it as a community. And then kind of set in contrast to that were those bigger environments around mainstream where they didn't feel like they belonged. And um, so one child, for example, um, who told me that she had dyslexia, she spoke about the idea of um, being made to read out in front of other children and how that made her feel essentially exposed. And she used um, a phrase that I'm not necessarily going to use in this context, but it's very derogatory for people with learning difficulties. And she said she was made to feel that way and that she didn't feel like she was part of the school. And that was a kind of routine conversation of those children who had what they call self-excluded. So they might not have been permanently excluded, but stopped attending for um, emotionally based school refusal. For example, they might have electively home educated before they kind of appeared back in the admissions criteria. So those ideas of belonging were really key. And um, I wrote an article a while ago now, I think about three years ago, probably, two years ago for schools week and talking about so often people castigate alternative provision and proves as being these um environments where children go who are poorly behaved naughty and um, often speaking about a kind of um it's the end for those children and i spoke about actually for some children it's the start it's um a it's the start of something new. And for a lot of them, it's because they feel part of a community. Now you have to get that community right. What you don't want is a community where, you know, behavior which is not conducive to society is encouraged or there aren't high aspirations or high expectations. Um, but I strongly believe that good AP um, can really change children's lives and but also families' lives who also may have had really poor relationships with schools for whatever reason. Um, I went off on a massive tangent then. Um, but the research I felt really important. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't even know what question you asked, to be honest, Pookie. I think it. Sarah talks passionately about AP as the, the heading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it. I, I talked passionately about AP. <laughs> it's my favourite role because I think the children have potentially been let down. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying let down by school or by family or necessarily by local authority or by anything, but by a kind of mashing together of not mm. kind of really understanding a child's needs um, or policies and processes which restrict the child's opportunities rather than seeing AP as part of a continuum of education and not and not every child will thrive in massive mainstream schools um, because they are bigger like the move from primary to secondary is huge for some of our children especially autistic girls for example yeah. I think that's really hard for them and and how do we support when a child has found a sense of belonging? Like I'm thinking in particular, so if you've got that kind of more therapeutic nurturing environment that we often find in alternative provision, or perhaps you've got children who are um, really settled in a like smaller, very community focused primary school, and then they're going off to big school. Like how do we support them to kind of continue to thrive when they go elsewhere? I think I think it's hard, and I think that's the kind of key a moment between year six and year seven and as a mum of a child who's just moved in from year six to year seven during a pandemic it was um, and I was really mindful of that she was in a one form entry school um transition is difficult I think you need to start with trying to understand where the child is at wherever that might be um and what things that they have found helpful from that small community group setting um or um you know rural setting for example and how can you how can you mirror some of those aspects whilst also holding those high aspirations? So moving from one form entry to a four form entry, I think there has to be understanding that's really difficult. Um, and sometimes transitions need to be slow. Um, I don't think you can under, um, I don't think you can negate the importance of relationships um, about having that kind of key person that they can contact. But also I find that some children find it difficult to ask for help mm. that they may not say that they need help they might be they might internalize it um and actually rather keep quiet um rather than saying actually i'm finding things really difficult so almost having that permission of this is the person you talk to if things feel difficult or if you're lost this is where you go um i know one school at the moment is using um, i think some additional funding and i'm sure there's many others about supporting that year six to year seven transition for a week where no other children are at the school environment. So they get to know their teachers, they get to know the environment where there aren't, you know, six formers plus year sevens. So they get to kind of experience it in a safer way that's a bit more kind of tailored for them. Um, 
but I think in answer to your question, there is no there is no magic bullet, I think, to support children. And so um, I produced a resource, um, and it's just free on the website, um, a transition resource where I spoke to parents and carers and educationalists around what did they find helpful for um, for transition and try to pull those things in together. And um, a librarian got involved, which was really interesting, and spoke about libraries as a safe oh, place. yes. Because they're quiet. And look, we're both surrounded by books. Yeah. Um, and it's that safe place where you can kind of immerse yourself, but they're quiet. Um, they're often not restricted use, but, you know, they're not kind of like a classroom that is more open. You might only be allowed to go at certain points, and that can be quite freeing. So... And there's rules, though. I, lo I always loved that. And I, I found this quite often when I've spoken to other autistic women in particular who got diagnosed later, but just basically spent the whole of school going, ah, um, that often the library, you, you knew how it worked. And usually there was a librarian there who was, you know, kind of similar uh, to. And yeah, you knew what the rules were. It's a really safe place and often a really safe person as well that yeah. you would find and exactly as you said, there's there's very specific rules. So my daughter um, used to love libraries. Obviously, we haven't kind of enjoyed them for the last few years. Um, and when she went into her new school, she was, um, bef because of COVID, she couldn't do it, but being a library helper, yeah. because there's particular rules. You take books out, they're given at this time, and if you don't give them back at that time, then it's a fine, and all those kind of like <laughs> very kind of rigid rules, but she gets. Yeah. Um, and I think... So even like breaking of rules can be quite difficult for autistic girls, I think. And and where they don't know when to break them, when it's okay mm. to break them. Mm. Or so one thing I keep on saying to my daughter is um because she doesn't have a bedtime now, because it's no school, what time can I stay awake till? Whenever you want. What? And I think she'd rather have that kind of actually, no, you need to be in yeah. bed by 10. She'd rather have that argument about the time than to not have a time. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's really interesting, actually. And and I have to say in our house, I, my daughters are 11. They're in, they've just finished year six. Um, and yeah, likewise, it's it's the holiday. But yeah, I think I just I just moved bedtime on and gave them a new rule. But yeah, they, they, they're, they're comfortable with that. But I, I think it is it is interesting, isn't it? But then I'm, yeah, I'm all about the rules. You you talked a little bit there about the, you know, how the relationship maybe is, is a key thing there, which feels like a very good Radio 2 style link to your <laughs> wonderful book. Um, so uh, you kindly sent me a copy recently of your book about behaviour. Um, but it's different than many books on behaviour. It's different than all books on behaviour, but uh, different in that it is very much about this kind of relationship and nurturing kind of approach and I wondered if you'd be happy to talk a little bit about why why you wrote it and why you thought this was an important kind of contribution to making what difference you hope it might make I think um why I wrote it is you know very basically someone asked me to which sounds because I don't think I would have ever thought that I would ever be in a position in which anyone would want to um hear what I had to say really and when I was growing up um going into um home was a very unsafe place I'll speak about this the other day incredibly unsafe space um it was violent it was traumatic you know and um I think aces in terms of adverse childhood experiences are a cliche and not necessarily helpful because you know I could count mine and I go into nine ten you know without a major issue and the school was my safe place and um, I speak about sort of right at the beginning about why I wrote the book. And um, I remember um, I'd already sorted out my apprenticeship to be a hairdresser, which is ironic because I'm not actually that bothered about hair. So I'm glad I didn't go down that route. Um, but I got my GCSEs and I did all right. And I went to go and speak to the new head of sixth form. And I think it's relevant he was new because he had no expectation of me because um, I was I was not really naughty, um, but I was like I had like six inch spikes and stuff like that. I was kind of <laughs> quite happy to not be at school. Um, but, and he, I asked if I could stay in for sixth form. He said, absolutely. And I still speak to Mr. Bryant and I still talk about him, obviously. Um, and he's a great teacher. It was the belief in my ability, I think was really powerful. And I could have easily been a few of those children um, in those book, in the books I talk about. And I think one of the reasons I spoke about it is that when I was becoming a teacher and when I was a teacher, there was no book that I could pick up and go, what can I do in this circumstance? What can I do to really help what's going on within the classroom setting? 
And being a teacher is really incredibly hard because you're faced with 30 kids that may or may not care what you're teaching about, may not care about what you're saying or what you're doing. And how do you approach that? But in that class of 30, you're going to have children that are really struggling and they're not struggling because of you and your lesson's not entertaining or you're not you know, funny enough and all those kind of cliches. They're struggling because actually things are really hard for them. And I get that as well. And I remember trashing um, an art room when I must have been, must have been about nine or nine or ten, trashed an art room, and actually I could have quite easily been excluded for that. And um, and it was because like so much was happening, and the art teacher just gave me like a pen and paper, and I never spoke about it again. So there was those kind of aspects around. I wanted teachers to be able to have something that they could utilise and use. Um, so to that end, um, I wrote the book, um, and like when I spoke to you sort of briefly like how do I feel about the book and yeah. I can't read it I find it like I can't read it from beginning to end because a I still can't believe that anyone has asked me to publish a book that's crazy um but also because the stories of all the children are true and um and it's sad you know it's sad that children are in distress and it's sad in the past and some of them may still be in distress and we still have children in distress so if I can minimize that distress um in any way I will um and um, I should be my, writing a proposal for the second book about um, it's going to be called Working Together Beyond the Classroom. So how do we work within a kind of multi-agency kind of aspect? Because schools are just one piece of a much bigger puzzle. Um, yeah. so. and can we talk for a moment about imposter syndrome? Because I find it like mind-boggling that you would say that you were surprised that anyone would want you to write a book or that anyone might want to read it when I know you only like since you've been a fully formed adult who has a huge amount of experience and wonderful very practical ideas always to share and I I can't like I'm I'm surprised you hadn't written before like I, I kind of almost have the opposite surprise of your surprise if that makes sense so why why is that why why the uncertainty about your I suppose like oh I suppose that's complex it's a complex question isn't it kind of imposter syndrome anyway yeah. I think um I'm I'm the first person in my family to go on to uh, finish school successfully so <laughs> not even get GCSEs or A levels but just to finish school successfully and um some people might be following my younger brother's story Warren who's um, been released from prison um last year and he's going to London School of Economics and he's he's such a clever young man I was going to call him boy but he's not a boy he's a man isn't he he's such a clever <laughs> young man and he had obviously those feelings of how can I do this like and yeah. he's going to London School of Economics to study sociology um have it a year out of prison so I think for me because of a series of kind of being told that you're you're not good enough and that um and kind of living on that kind of that arousal level of fear for many 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 years i think does have a kind of fundamental impact upon how you see yourself but also i think because i've had significant mental health issues um and that makes you question yourself i think generally so um which is weird actually because i've had ocd and ocd gives you this magical power where you can like save people's lives doesn't it um which obviously i'm not very good at um because i don't, don't have magical power so it's almost like the like trying to create kind of a resource to be better than you are um and i just think it's just i don't know like i just think it's a it's just a process and what i've decided and i think having Tourette syndrome as well like one of the things i talk about is um I used to pride myself on my ability to be very exact about what I say. And then my Tourette's got worse after the birth of my daughter. And and that really hampered how some people viewed me, especially like out and about and things like that. Um, and I was also very overweight. I was eight stone bigger. Um, so I think all of those kind of factors kind of makes, oh, why would anyone want to employ me? And then I listen, <laughs> this sounds terrible. And then I listen to some people speak um, like famous people that may be in governments and politics. And I think, oh my goodness, um, I'm probably all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to say there's nothing, yeah, that kind of 
helps to because I I I, it's, I always find it interesting talking to you because actually there's a lot about our journeys that are, are quite similar albeit it's exhibited in slightly different ways but I have the yeah those very similar feelings around imposter syndrome however I also have that similar thing of going and seeing uh, other people speak sometimes and it can be a bit like emperor's new clothes like there's someone in particular who um, I have seen speak more than once who is published and um, everyone always raves about this person. Um, and and I, I've always come away really nonplussed and not understanding it at all. And even when I've been in the same room as all the other people and all the other people have gone on about how wonderful this guy is. And I'm like, I don't, I don't get it at all. Yeah, but I, I mean, find I, that helps a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I don't mean it's like, I have to say it's mainly kind of people that I will never meet and yeah. things like that and it's on tv so it's no one that you know like, you know, <laughs> like don't worry edgy twitter it's fine it's not like someone <laughs> um but also you like i find that you learn so much from people as well when you listen to them and you're like oh my goodness but also seeing other people's enthusiasm yeah. and encouragement for people that may not be perfect um yeah. is really profound i think um and that can really help but i also made a decision um and it was when my daughter was four um it was quite a while ago now because she's coming up to 12 and it was i wasn't going to let my tourettes stop me yeah. and part of that was that um my daughter and i oh um went traveling together uh, we went to romania together when she was four years old just us two wow. me picking away at the airport and we loved it from beginning to end and then that was part of the i'm not letting Tourette stop me do anything yeah. um, and um this is you know i'm going to do this and actually um my difficulties are my difficulties but actually i still have stuff i can offer and i'm not perfect and i think that's okay as well so like i say all the time you know you can buy my book but there's lots of other books out there that are great too this is not the panacea you won't pick up this book and go oh everything is really meaningful i mean you might and that's great please write a review if you do um <laughs> generally speaking it's it's about like collecting ideas and approaches there is no one size fits all and not everyone is going to find me amazing if they hear me speak but like but equally not everyone's going to find me awful when i speak i think it's it's really important though that kind of um authenticity that you bring in like bringing your whole self to your work because i do think that there's not necessarily a lot of people who have the kind of experience that you have had um growing up or that are living with you know like living with threats and, and managing that and, and ocd you know the these things i do think i yeah it, it can be really worrying about whether this will undermine your credibility and it can make you fearful of being in this world however when you're able to stand up and give of your best self then i think that is such important role modeling even if sometimes it might be imperfect or messy especially almost if it's sometimes a little you know a little messy you're um you're expecting identical twins at the moment very excitingly um i i can't like not address this in in the in the podcast i can't have you here and not talk to you about this and it i guess it, it made me wonder a little bit like um what what is your hope in terms of obviously your daughter's a little bit older and there's there's a bit of a gap there do you think the world has changed like and by the time your twins arrive what kind of you know what do you hope might have moved on even just a little bit in terms of what their experience might be of of the world and school and stuff such a good question and actually I think so interestingly enough I've gone back into kind of um you know maternity care and things like that and I've gone Oh, not enough has changed. Not oh, really. Changed. Yeah, yeah, really. I get really grumpy about certain things. Um, I was asked um, the other day, um, because this is what I tell everyone, and actually we spoke about it beforehand, I've got a shared placenta, which means all the babies have a shared placenta. I don't have any placenta belonging to me. My babies do. <laughs> which means we have to have additional scans because there's several different kind of particular things that can go wrong with that. And the sonographer asked me, um, like, do you know what the implications of that were? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, what are they? And I said, this, this, and this. And he said, are you a little bit autistic? And I said, you, you, you can't be a little bit autistic. <laughs> Breathe. Uh, and I said, well, why did you ask that? And he said, um, because you seem to know quite a lot about it. And I said, because it's happening to my bodies and my babies. And there's that kind of bit about a woman knowing her place yeah, in the medical wow. discourse that sadly seems to um still exist um so there's those so has things changed for my daughters and what do i hope 
especially around education. I think the biggest thing for my daughter, my oldest daughter, um, my only daughter at the moment, technically, is um, I think she felt, I think she feels incredibly lonely. May or may not be because she's an only child, she's got friends, but her internalisation is that she feels lonely and she feels different. Mm. I think what's interesting about twins, I think that is very unlikely to occur. Yeah. And that's um, quite exciting in yeah, a way. Yeah. Also, it's unlikely to occur because they will have a big sister. Even if there was just one of them, they'll have a big sister, um, which I think will help with that kind of loneliness. I also think um, in terms of education, um, so I was really struggled with different things around school, um, around that kind of, you know, she has an anxiety disorder and so on. And it's, she's really, really struggled. I don't want that for the twins. I don't know if that will occur because I think th there's often lots of blame on the parent about it as well as if I've made that occur, like, you know, because it's attachment, because I'm, you know, because of the, and it's like, no, it's not. It's just like how she is about how she interprets the world. Um, and I think mothers of autistic children often get that anyway. They get a lot of kind of yeah. blame about parenting. Um, I think it was the refrigerator mother thing, wasn't it, about culture? Yeah. yeah. Um, which I was thinking about the other day. I don't think enough has changed. And actually, I think in some ways we've gone backwards around inclusive education. And that worries me. Um, whilst I, you know, I, I sing the praises of AP and PRU, I think that schools should also have the mechanism to be able to support children with a wide range of diversity. And I don't think it's about economics. I don't think it's about budgeting or money um, because so much goes into special educational needs to fight parental choice. I think it's often a lack of belief in parents' experiences and a lack of trust about parents and what they're reporting. Um, and that's why I want to write the next book, Working Together, because I think there's yeah, I don't think there has been enough change. And I think where the change has occurred, it's not one that I'm necessarily particularly excited about for my children. So, yeah, it's a bit negative, isn't it? I've just, like, thrown my children into, like, a dystopian educational universe. Yeah. Not that depressing, though. Anyway, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it, yeah, that it's a it is a really difficult, cool thing isn't it and and I think you know the world is a really strange place right now anyway and I don't think any of us can quite predict what's gonna kind of happen next and I, I kind of there's a little part of me that feels a bit hopeful about some of the changes that we've seen as a result of the pandemic that maybe might mean that you know our uh, the, the the world changes but I'm not sure I think going back to your point there about the twins never feeling lonely it just really made me think of my daughters so um my daughters are both in the same year at school. They're actually second cousins by birth, but have been raised like twins. Um, and the really interesting thing for us has been that they're such a unit and they're such close friends and so important to each other that it has meant, you know, things like Lyra's only had her autism diagnosis really recently, age 11, despite the fact that I specialize in this because they're always together. And she's never like displayed a lot of the typical things you might expect because Ellie is the social glue. And so Lyra's not seemed to have any of the issues we might have expected. And it's only when we'd split them that we began to see those issues. And likewise, Ellie struggles significantly with um, the academic side of things. But again, until they were apart, um, we didn't realize because Lyra would sit next to her and help her. And they're such a great unit. And it's, when I reflect on it, it makes me feel guilty as a parent for not realizing the individual Individual challenges they have but on the other hand looking at them and thinking what an awesome pair they are and the really nice thing is the belonging doesn't it they yeah belong. absolutely they each have each other all the time and they can fight like cat and dog but they're so important to each other and and that's been for us a really interesting thing of the pandemic because they actually chose to be apart um and then during the course of the pandemic spent so much time together and actually went through a, almost like a regressional stage where they like would often sleep in the same bed and that kind of thing um, and then decided they absolutely wanted to be together and have asked to be in the same form group in the same school and everything when they go to secondary which yeah i, I 
and there's something as yeah and I guess you'll find this with your twins that there's something as a mum that's really lovely about that they've made that decision you know I when they're very little and there is that temptation always want to do things together but they've kind of found, found their own ways and kind of gone apart and always come back together which I think is I think really choice is really important. So people ask me a lot, are you going to dress them identically? And I'm like, no. Uh, one, because I'm never going to be able to tell them apart anyway. <laughs> I just don't want to give myself extra work here. But also, they are their own humans. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I probably have just one set of clothes initially and then just swap them over because that's fine. But I don't want two of the same. Um, but, yeah, I'm not going to recognise them anyway. But, yeah, the idea of them being together. <laughs> but, all, yeah, so being safe and secure apart, again, um is really important but I, I hear what you say about the mother's guilt the mother's guilt is huge it doesn't matter what you do um whether or not you found it whether or not you kind of identified it really early you'd be told that um you're a parent that you know is too involved with your children's lives you see it late and then you, you blame yourself anyway so it doesn't really matter what you do and, and we do we're gonna feel guilty you're right <laughs> yeah, that's the thing and that's the thing i've kind of um i started i think because i had significant mental health, health issues when i was born that I've now come to a place going because I've been made to feel guilty for so many decisions um, and some of those may have had an impact and I'm sure some of them did but also it goes back to those notions of good enough parenting you know my my daughter does have a safe place where she feels like she belongs you know at home at least in that environment um, and yeah you do the best with resources and circumstances that you have um, yeah guilt I think guilt is very much a kind of construct of parenthood I think which is sad really isn't it well and I think it's it's challenging as well like right from the moment that you are clearly pregnant people start trying to give you advice don't they and I guess you faced this earlier than uh, most would because I think you kind of you carrying twins and and uh, yeah you you definitely yeah, I'm doing obviously pregnant, pregnant. and and when I'm vomiting outside places I'm like I'm pregnant I'm not drunk I'm pregnant and uh, <laughs> people when it's twins though they they rather than saying congratulations they just say good luck <laughs> it's a really marked difference good luck okay um yeah, see you in yeah. Two, yeah. <laughs> loads of people give advice and some of it i listen to it some of it i ignore um and that's you know um if you go on twitter anyway and you engage in any education educational discourse um it becomes very polarized and they yeah. like that as well everything is this or this and actually there's a lot more kind of nuanced approach that needs to be taken for both of those discussions yeah, and I get that that takes me kind of back to your book, actually. And I because I'd wondered about this, like I, I have for a long time not been brave enough to really publicly have a view on behavior just because I, I don't like it when people hate me. Um, and that might sound no, but, you know, like I don't like it either when people yeah. hate me. Like, it's, it's not a really nice position to be in, is it? <laughs> no, but when you start talking about behavior and I do actually have really strong views on it and I have started very much engaging with uh, those views more now. But there is really polarized views on behavior and there's basically basically the kind of the, the the kind of relational and kind and understanding and responding to need and supportive sort of approach and then there's the other approach and I just wondered whether you'd had any kind of backlash or difficulty following your book so uh, no surprisingly oh. um, no none at all um and and despite what Phil Beadle said about it, which was very polarising in terms of his opinion, um, and I'm a big fan of Phil Beadle because he was on TV when I was training to be a teacher, so I, I, um, I'm absolutely delighted he read it. So I walk a very particular line online, and it's very intentional. Um, and the line is that you wouldn't, I don't think, um, be able to consider about what line that I sit in. And I decided not that many years ago, not as many years ago as it should have been, to not argue online. Yeah. Um, because actually I get so invested in the arguments, I get so enraged that it's just not healthy for me. Um, and that was after having an argument about whether or not a tortoise should wear a nappy, so let alone about children. Just not doing it. Yeah, it's literally reptile forums are a terrible place to be. Um, and I intentionally, um, I mute certain words so I don't see certain words. Um, but I would engage in conversation with people um, in a way that I hope is conducive and helpful. Um, I will present at conferences that are probably quite um, diverse in their opinions. So I will, um, I've will i presented at Research Ed, which is run by Tom Bennett, but also um, Lose the Booths with Paul Dix. Um, and I am because I want the voices of the children that I work with to be heard by all. 
Um, and that's my kind of absolute positioning is that I want the voices of the children to echo beyond my own personal echo chamber, whatever my kind of belief system is. Um, and I do feel very strongly about things. And if people come and listen to me, they probably hear that. Um, but actually, if you read and I've got behind me, I've got Tom Bennett's book. I've got Paul Dix's book because there is no panacea. Um, I've got my own book. I've got lots of books in between um, that take out what's helpful for you but also don't lose your moral sight about what's healthy for children um and and that's like you know i do the kids uh, mental health chat on a tuesday um which is well attended by psychologists psychiatrists uh, parents and uh, lots and lots of parents and teachers and i'm very keen on making sure it's not a space that is argumentative but it's collaborative um so no, I haven't had any backlash to my face. I mean, there might be loads of kind of messages going, God, that book's rubbish. Um, but the thing is, if they don't want to read it, they won't read it. Um, so, but no, so far, all my reviews are really nice, really nice, like on That's Amazon. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really pleased to hear that. Just that, yeah, behaviour can be such a, yeah, hot, hot button topic. Why does it matter to you so much that those voices are heard? That sounded an accusatory question. I'm a hundred percent on side with this, by the way. I just would love to hear about why, why. Um, I think it's really easy to silence um, children's voices. Um, my voice was pretty silent when I was younger, um, for lots of re different reasons. I wasn't able to speak out. Um, and I don't want children to have that experience where their viewpoints aren't held. Um, for me, it's a human rights aspect around children's rights and participation um, and beyond notions of to being tokenistic. Um, and those children that have spoken to me or um, or I've talked or I've supported in various different ways um, have, have told me something through their behaviour, through what they've said. Um, and I think that's really important that's heard. Um, and I think because we can learn so much from children, often, you know, it's the cliche, isn't it? You know, children are experts of their own experiences. Um, yeah. Just like you're an expert of your own experience and so on. And and sometimes people may not have ever had those kind of um, opportunities to hear those voices in more detail. And if it can help shift understanding to be something that is more inclusive, then I want to do that. And I don't want to close off those conversations with everyone. And actually, when I listen to, you know, as I said, I don't agree with everyone, but also, is it going to be effective if I have a moan via the format of Twitter? No, I'd rather have a direct conversation with someone and going, actually, this makes me feel really uncomfortable. And I have those conversations all the time with in my day job going, hmm, I don't think that's appropriate or I'm not sure or holding people to account. But, you know, how many characters we got on Twitter? That is, it's, 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 all I'm going to do is get people's backs up. They're going to block me. They're going to mute me. Lots of people do that anyway. Um, but it's not helpful anyway, so... Yeah. But no, no one's been horrible about my book. That's good. Well, clearly, because it's a really good book. <laughs> uh, I think, though, as well, that you are quite, um, I was saying to you offline before um, we started recording, one of the things that I really like and really respect, actually, about the way in which you've written your book is that you don't actually say this is the way to do it. You you share a wide range of experiences and say, here are some things that might help. And you're quite kind of open to the fact that different things will work for different people mm -hmm. and that it's not all going to be plain sailing. And I think I think that is really really important um but yeah also uh hopefully less likely to uh yeah evoke uh irh responses from those I mean, the only thing right. about not being controversial is that um you don't you don't earn as much money if you're controversial you get mm -hmm. you get more people more interested in booking you for speaking and presenting and all those sorts of things or buying your book because what what has she said i don't have any of that and that's hard as well because that kind of knowledge that my voice is maybe not loud as some people um because i'm not controversial um but i've i've taken that deliberate line um and i might revisit that line and go oh i'm not happy about that there's, there's it's now actually beyond the pale um, mm -hmm. and i need to kind of speak up more robustly about xyz um i don't think we are there yet i think we could be there in the future and i you know it depends like so we've got the behavior consultation by the government at the moment that will be interesting to see what comes out from there um but i would rather be consulted on that and write my particular views and spout a tweet that's kind of meaningless really yeah i i, I yeah i i've got a lot of respect for that and i think there's a lot to be said actually for engaging with different points of view rather than just living in an echo chamber but as you say staying staying true to your morals and what's always asking the question what's best for the children yeah, absolutely
I'm, we're coming to the end of our time, but I, I can't finish without asking you just to maybe explain so that people can go away and use this idea. You're, you talk about your cornerstone um, of, of supporting children, understanding behaviour being around noticing, understanding and responding. Um, and I thought that, you know, I always like to take these little bite sized bits out to share with people. And that felt to me like a really powerful triad. And I wondered if you wouldn't mind just explaining a little bit about what you mean by that and how you use that in your day to day. Yeah, so I think quite often, um, and I've done it, I do all the time, um, you might notice something that's happened and then you move straight on to responding. So you might notice, for example, that um, Liam is tapping his pen incessantly on his table all the time. And your response to that might be, you know, actually, Liam, if you don't stop tapping your pen on the table, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Liam continues because he doesn't notice or whatever. And then your response to that might then be further to it could be a detention, it could be isolation room, it could be sending out, things escalate. My idea was actually you notice something first, then you try to understand it, then you respond. Because actually, if your response doesn't build in those concepts around understanding, then your response is meaningless because it may not kind of help or enhance the practice that's happening. Now, it could be absolutely that Liam is being a right pain and, you know, you've noticed he's banging his pen and he's banging his pen and you've stopped to understood it as actually he's trying to be annoying because of X, Y, Z. Well, that's fine. And that has a different response. But it could be just that he doesn't even notice. It could be, for example, he has OCD and has to do it 30 times. Obviously, that's like at the end of this kind of spectrum. Um, or it could just be that he needs something to fiddle with. And, you know, like sometimes I hold my pen during interviews and things like that and meetings. But without building in that key component of understanding, then your response is going to be um, at best ineffective uh, and it will become routinized rather than actually something about the individual child. Um, so the idea is just notice, understand and then respond um, rather than kind of jumping ship, basically.